Be careful what you wish for. everybody my first franchise of the year is over we've done the predator franchise it's time to move on to the Wishmaster series there's four total as of now i don't think there's any sequels in the works yet but these are late 90s early 2000s movies that completely flew under the radar i never heard of them until last year i've owned this four pack for a few months now it's just been sitting on my shelf because i knew eventually i would want to review these and boy am i glad that I finally saw Wishmaster. This was awesome. I didn't know what to expect, which is probably why I loved it even more. If I knew everything about this movie, it probably wouldn't have had the same effect on me, but man, this was great. Just sitting there watching the opening tiles, like Kane Hodder, Tony Ty, Robert Engel. I was like, oh shit, oh shit, oh! Like, holy crap, like yeah, all these people in this movie. And that's not the only reason why this movie is awesome. All right, you got effects by Nick Otero and Robert Kurtzman. He's the director of this. You got the horror alumni. This movie was produced by Wes Craven. Wes Craven Presents. This has so many names attached to it. It feels very high, you know, production. You know, it feels like it has a lot of money behind it, but it's like a $5 million budget, which isn't a lot compared to other movies. So, and this was released on my second birthday, 1997. Like I said, this was directed by Ron Kurtz, Robert Kurtzman, who did all kinds of effects for all kinds of horror movies with Greg Nicotero. He worked on the Evil Dead movies, Intruder, which I reviewed recently. So these guys are special effects gurus. And then they make this movie, so you you should expect some great fucking practical effects, and they are amazing. But we're not talking about the pros and cons yet, but I just can't stress this enough. That was just awesome. This movie has a 26% on Rotten Tomatoes. What the fuck? This does not deserve a 26%. Really? Who? I, I don't get Rotten Tomatoes. Some of the worst movies have the best scores, and then some of the greatest movies have the worst it makes no sense i guess i'm just in the minority uh director has a cameo in here too i thought that was kind of cool to see him get his like head ripped off and you got Vern troyer who plays uh the baby version of the Jen character and the opening narration was by angus scrim aka the tall man from the phantasm franchise a franchise that i just recently bought the five pack for and i will probably review those too sometime this year don't quote me on that. Maybe I won't. I don't know. Things can change. And Harry Manfredini did the score for this movie. The guy behind all of those Friday the 13th movies and Slaughter High and so on and so forth. Horror classic after horror classic and a horror franchise Friday the 13th. Hell yeah. So you know you're going to get a good score in this movie. And boy, is it. So let's really get into the movie in this week's horror franchise, Wednesday. The only nitpicks I have for this movie, the only thing is I did not care for, is the jump scares. There's at least three or four where it just a random character will pop in and then that music kicks in. And it's very loud. You just will almost want to turn down your TV real quick. <laughs> but it's just unnecessary. It's dumb. You know I hate it, so I had to mention it. Fucking quit with the jump scares. It's, it's cheap. Just stop. And I also just found... The whole concept of the main girl in this movie, Alex, she's telepathically kind of connected to the gym. Like, whenever he kills somebody, whenever he's about to do some harm, or when he is, she starts, like, freaking out. Like, she'll start crying, or she'll start, like, seizing up, and, like, shaking, and then she's on the ground, convulsing. It just kind of reminded me of Jaws of Revenge. And when your movie reminds me of that movie, that's not a good thing. So, I just thought that was cheesy, kind of unnecessary, too. Like, why does she need to have that connection wasn't necessary i don't know it just kind of looked dumb she didn't need that like the gym was gonna find her that was his goal so she didn't need to know about like when he was attacking someone because it's not like she ever actually tries to save anybody it never helps her out knowing what he's about to do so it, it was just dumb you know just a little nitpick i would just take that out but moving on to the positives i mentioned it before the practical effects are spectacular like the opening like even the cgi like digital stuff like computer generated like effects 
they look good for the time. This is 1997. The fact that these looked okay, I thought was amazing. Like, you would expect it to be shitty with a $5 million budget. Maybe you would think that's not enough. But the things that they pull off in this movie, I thought were great. Like the guy turning into the wall and then this guy turning into a glass door. Like, it all looked great. And then the practical effects, people's skeletons coming out and heads coming off, the gore. It all looks fantastic. I can't stress enough. My jaw literally like dropped in the opening like three minutes. I was like, holy shit, I was not expecting this. It was just awesome. I was on board from that moment on and I was never bored. This movie never slows down. It's got a great pace. It's 90 minutes long, average runtime. I love the character of the djinn. I love that this is an evil genie movie and it's not really cheesy. You know, you would expect that on paper, like evil genie kills people. That's going to be corny. But no, they take it kind of serious-ish. But there's humor involved too in the humor lands. Like, it's dark comedy. Like, people dying, but you can't help but laugh at how they're dying. And just certain wishes that people make and how he, like, flips their words. You know, like, he deceives them. Like, they think that they're going to get their wish, but he takes it like an evil spin on it. I just love the idea behind this evil genie granting evil wishes like he's gonna give you a million dollars but there's gonna be some consequences and it's just funny there's so many moments where i was laughing i was having a great time i loved all the cameos in here king hodder playing a security guard tony todd playing like a bouncer robert england has a more pivotal role in the movie like he kind of is the reason for the gin being in here because he's buying the statue with the gin inside it um i dug the main girl in here, uh, Alex, and I liked, they kind of quickly build her relationship with her best friend who's like in the friend zone. He's like, oh, come on, just a dinner and a movie. Let's go out. Let's take this to the next level. And she's like, no, I want you as a friend. And it's just enough to where you actually kind of sympathize with him when he, you know, dies. Spoiler, it's like the first like 15 minutes of the movie, he dies, but it's it actually kind of made me sad. Like I felt for his character, you know? And usually that doesn't happen, but because of his situation and what we were given, you know, the information we got about those characters, for some reason I was just kind of like, oh, I actually feel kind of bad for this guy. And if you can do that, that's a good thing. Because horror movies, they usually always fail at making you care about the characters when they want you to. Sometimes they don't care if you do care, but this movie, I think, succeeds in making you actually sympathize with that guy and wanting her to succeed in her journey to stop the gym. Now let's talk about the djinn. So this movie ha gives you all the lore behind the guy, and I like the lore. I like the exploration of this guy, the rules they establish, and I love that they actually put this scene in the movie. And it's not too spoiler-ish, but she basically goes, oh, I get a wish. Okay, I wish you would just kill yourself. All right, blow your freaking brains out. And he's like, okay, See, I'm still alive. Like, he can't kill himself. And I'm glad that scene was in here because then I would just be sitting here like, why didn't she just wish for him to kill himself? Boom, movie over. I'm glad that the writer took time to think of plot holes and like, well, I'll write that in there, the explanation. So, great writing right there. And speaking of the writer, this is Peter Atkins, the guy who wrote Hellraiser 2 and 3, I think. And if you watched my Hellraiser review series, you know I was not huge on Hellraiser 2. I thought it was just kind of boring. When I saw his name at the credits at the beginning, like, Peter Atkins, I was like, oh, shit. But boom, like, this movie was great. And this is a first-time director, Robert Kurtzman, a special effects artist. Damn good job for a first time. And, yeah, I just can't praise it enough. Uh, got the horror alumni, the gore... The gin, I like his voice. I like his character when he's in human form. Just the way he like manipulates people into making wishes without realizing it. And I like that in this movie, they don't have to say like, I wish this. They just have to like basically be like, yeah, I would like that. And then he'd be like, boom, I gotcha. You know, he'll just say things like, don't you wish this? And they'd be like, yeah. And he's like, all right, I gotcha. So I thought that was kind of neat and different because usually in genie movies, they always have to say the words, I wish. Otherwise, it doesn't count. In this movie, nope. As long as you say, yeah, I would like that. And, or if he asks you a question about wouldn't you want this and you say yes, that's all he needs. You know, I don't want to go on for too long. I want to 
get more into my spoiler discussion. So final thoughts before we dive into the film way more. This is fantastic. It's got great gore, great effects, even the CGI digital ones. You got horror alumni in here. You got Kang Hodder, Tony Todd, and even Robert Kurtzman <laughs> as a cameo. You got all kinds of cameos. And it's just a fun, awesome ride. I enjoyed myself every minute of the way. Doesn't really slow down at all. Great pace. So when it comes to Wishmaster, you can't go wrong with this one. Go out and buy it. The hottest chick in this movie will go to Alex's sister, Shannon. She's smoking. And the best scene in this movie will go to the uh, club massacre, the party massacre towards the end, and even the opening massacre. I really like both scenes about equally. So yeah, those are my favorite scenes. Uh, my third uh, honorable mention would be Kang Hodder's scene, but we'll get there later. All right, now let's talk about the movie. Let's go over my notes. So this movie opens up in Persia in the year 1727 uh, AD, I think it said, or BC. I think it was AD. So, yeah. <laughs> but then we get all this mayhem. You got people just getting ripped apart, tentacles coming out, people just turning into monsters, people getting thrown to the wall, and they're, like, becoming the wall automatically. This guy's skeleton comes out of his own face and arm. Like, his skeleton inside him comes to life and breaks out. And the effects there, that was when I was, like, in. I was, like, all right, this is awesome. I'm glad that there, that wasn't, like, the best of, and then it was all downhill after that. It's just great effects after great effects in almost every other scene. Here's a dumb thing I want to point out. This movie makes the fatal mistake of saying present day. Because after the Persia shit, it goes present day. You mean it's 2020? I don't think so. The cars, the style, the music, none of it is 2020. You don't say present day. I believe Friday the 13th does that too. It goes present day. It's like, oh really? So they dress like that in 2020? I don't think so. You don't say that. It should say 1997 or 96 or whenever they were filming this, and it would make more sense. So never say present day. And then <laughs> you got Ted Raimi in here, you know, which makes sense because of his past, you know, projects with the Nicotero and Kurtzman people, the NTB, I think that's the name, or NBK. They have like a, it's their initials put together, their company. They work with them on Intruder. So Ted Raimi's in here. He's standing underneath this crate and it just falls on him. It crushes him like that kid in Final Destination 2. And I just find it funny because he doesn't get out of the way. There's like a full like three to five seconds where he's just like, oh my gosh, it's about to crush me. It's like, just dive to the left, in front of you, the right, behind you, every direction, north, south, east, west. Just get out of the way. But nope, he just gets crushed like a bug. Uh, you don't really see any blood or gore there. Like in Final Destination 2, that was awesome. It's nowhere near that level, which is actually kind of shocking, given everything else in the movie. Like, I don't know, like, why didn't they try really showing, like, his the aftermath of his corpse? I was shocked that we didn't get to see that. I would have liked to see, like, the aftermath of his body on the ground all mangled. You see, like, blood splatter on a statue that they retrieve. That's it. So this guy steals the stem, the, the stem, the stone, the stone out of, or the gym. Yeah, that's right. I was mixing stone and gym together. That's how I said That's why. <laughs> I just realized that. Okay, he steals the gym out of the statue, this dock worker, and goes and pawns it off. And then the pawn guy takes it to this company where the main girl, Alex, works. And Alex knows Josh. And he works at like a science place with this thermal imaging device. And she breathes on it, <sighs> breathes life into it, literally. And then it come, and basically that means that she's going to be connected to the gym throughout the rest of the movie. And she gives it to her uh, soon-to-be boyfriend at the end of the movie, her best friend in the friend zone. And he puts it in the thermal imaging thing and it just explodes. And then we see the baby version of the djinn. I find that interesting, too. Like, why does the djinn come out in baby form? Like, because when we see him, like, at the very end when he's defeated and he gets sucked back into the gym, he's in his adult form inside. So is it like every time he comes out of it, he has to, like, start over, I guess. I don't know. But the effects on him, he's all slimy and scaly. He's crawling towards him. It's kind of creepy. And he's like, do you wish for the suffering to be over? And then the boyfriend's like, yes. And I guess he, like, stops his heart or his heart explodes inside or something. But that was Vern Troyer from Austin Powers in that suit. 
And with each kill and each wish, he gets more powerful. Makes sense. <laughs> we get this bum played by Buck Flowers, who does a lot of John Carpenter movies. He plays like a bum and they live. And just some of the dialogue that he has with this pharmacist is hilarious. At one point, he like yells like, you educated idiot. <laughs> like, it's like an oxymoron, right? Bald-headed baboon. <sighs> this complected afterbirth of a Chinese gangbanger. Educated idiot. The bum guy, he's pissed off. He's like, I wish cancer on that asshole. And then the guy just starts like, just convulsing his face is like bubbling and like ooze is coming out of his nose so it's like he got like every cancer known to man at one point unless that's just what cancer looks like but i've never seen cancer where you you start bubbling and mustard looking sauce comes out of your nose it was just disgusting looking and then yeah we find out about alex's past she saved her sister from a burning fire a house that was on fire but her parents died so she feels guilty about it and, and then that kind of comes into play later on in the movie towards the end when her sister, she gets sucked into like the painting and she's on fire and she has to save her once again. This like mortician student comes in, he like makes his eyes sink in and that <laughs> was pretty funny. Some, yes, yeah, like there's some dark humor like that sprinkled throughout. And then the cashier, she's like really into this guy. <laughs> like he doesn't look ugly, but he doesn't look like so hot that this young cashier would be like staring at him like he's freaking like brad pitt or something like the way she looks at him the way she acts it's like she's like madly in love with him like i thought for a second maybe he was putting like some kind of love spell on her by staring at her you know like the guy in blood dino he can just stare at you and like hypnotize you but no she was really into him but then she's like i wish i was beautiful forever and he turns <laughs> he turns her into a mannequin and then we get this awesome ass scene at the police station he goes to this detective he's trying to figure out where um alex is so he talks to this detective and he's like you see that guy over there man he's been getting away with crime after crime they keep letting him go because of technicalities and whatnot i just wish he would just finally get killed and arrested or whatnot that he would get busted in the act officially like you know so much evidence that no one could deny it so he's like all right and then the guy just picks up his gun and starts shooting a couple of cops. He tears a cop's, like, freaking jaw off, Victor Crowley style. Blood oozing out of his mouth. Awesome. And then he just gets shot a bunch of times. And, like, he's, like, so, like, just so, like, supernaturally, like, strong that the bullets aren't killing him. But then finally he dies. That was just an awesome scene. I just, that was just freaking fantastic. Over-the-top violence. You also get to see Atkins Boulevard on, like, a business card which is a obvious nod to the writer, Peter Atkins. And then we see Kane Hodder as a security guard. And I love his back and forth with the guy. He's like, I'm going in there one way or another. And you're like, oh yeah, try me. It's like, it's like, and then he like tries to like, you know, manipulate him into making a wish that he would regret. But instead, Kane Hodder's like, I wish you would leave. And he's like, oh shit. And he like has to like walk. And you can tell he's like fighting it. Kane Hodder in the back, he's like... The only way you're coming in here is through me, and I would love to see you do that. Boom! Turns him into the glass door, walks right through him, and then he shatters into a bunch of pieces. That was just hilarious. And then the, the Nick guy, who was the funniest character in this movie, I really liked him. He was kind of like zany and wacky, just the way he, the facial expressions he would make. He's probably my favorite character, besides King Hodder, because I just love him in anything, and I like the gin also, but... This guy, Nick, he wishes for like a million dollars and then it cuts to his mom signing like a will. Like, in, in the event of my death, my son will get a million dollars. And then it cuts again to her on an airplane that blows up. It's like, all right, you got a million dollars now. Apparently your mom's rich. <laughs> but when he turns like that one thing into something more valuable, there's all kinds of like stones and gems that come out of it. He's like scooting it off the table. Like, no, I won't tell you where she lives, but thank you for the gems. And then we see Tony Todd. And he's just badass all the time. Like, he's got a badass voice. He's the bodyguard. And then Jin, he's just going on and on about, like, don't you wish you could just escape, you know, quit this job and escape? And he's like, yeah, I do. And then he just, he walks away. And then in the background, you see Tony Todd in, like, a big, like, fish tank in a straight jacket chained up. <laughs> he's like, Houdini escaped in two and a half minutes. Good luck. And then we get Robert England. They're at the party. 
and Robert England wishes that he could throw the party of the century, and everything's just going chaotic. There's chaos erupts, and like statues are coming to life, just throwing like arrows at people. I think like I don't know. Like no, I think one of them was supposed to be the Bazoo, whatever the monster is called, the demon and the exorcist. It looked like it. And then I looked it up and I think it was. Yeah, the statues, they come to life, all that. Practical work, the costumes, awesome. Fucking, it looks amazing how they did that. You know, just like the wooden Indian in Creepshow 2, how he held still and the, the appliance on that guy. He looked like a freaking wooden Indian. Robert England, he's like throwing up like this tentacle monster out of his mouth. Piano wires takes this one guy's head off. That was the director. All kinds of gore effects in that scene. Just another amazing scene. And then, yeah, the main girl, she wishes for the drunk guy at the very beginning not to be drinking on the job so that he wouldn't release the crate and then the statue wouldn't break open and therefore the gym wouldn't have been stolen by the dock worker and none of the movie would have happened. So she basically changes the future by changing the past you know <laughs> back to the future rules she changed the past and therefore the current future has changed so i guess the moral lesson of this movie isn't be isn't you know be careful what you wish for it's don't drink on the job all right that's what i learned and yeah then we find out that the gin is inside the statue again and then it's gonna get auctioned off and sets up a sequel i also like the look of the the gin's like lair when he's inside the the gym it's like all red and just the way the halls look the smoke the fog I like the way all that looks oh yeah and then that that lair of his like all the souls he collects they're like up against the wall like fused with it all in agony so yeah awesome movie can't recommend it enough um if i had to give a mr hadaworth the best kill i really love that skeleton coming out of the guy at the very beginning that was probably one of my favorite practical effects in the film but there's so much to choose from so it's not saying much you know because there's a lot but that was my favorite one that was the one that made my jaw drop when i saw it it was like the most shocking and the mr twig award for lamest kill will go to josh who just i think his heart just stops and yeah that's it but then he's technically not dead at the very end because she undoes all the damage and nobody dies so technically this has a kill count of zero present day, but everybody in Persia did die. I believe, yeah. And I'm glad that she did that, now that I think about it. I'm glad that she did, you know, I wish this didn't happen. Because they could have went the typical, like, she researches, you know, the spell, the curse, the voodoo, you know, the chant to say. And then it just would have came off as corny if she was, like, in that room later on yelling a bunch of like latin gibberish at the monster and he's like oh no oh my weakness and then like faded away i'm glad she just came up with a smart wish to like out you know, to make him go away so i'm glad they went that route instead so, yeah those are my thoughts on Wishmaster. what did you think about Wishmaster? put your thoughts in the comments below if you haven't seen it check it out it's totally worth it and yeah thank you so much for joining me tonight if you like what you've seen here you can hit this like button share with all your friends and become a patreon today and become a subscriber just by clicking on my cartoon face in about five seconds. And until next time, Alpha V for C.